ADP has your back with ADP Marketplace, a digital HR storefront. Be a more trusted advisor to your clients by recommending apps to help streamline HR processes and free up time to focus on people. Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, ADP Marketplace, later in the episode. If you think about it, really, going virtual is forcing the schools to adapt to the new world of work. The the traditional education where you sit at a desk and you have a bell that rings every hour is based on the factory model. And it was designed to teach children to be good little factory workers someday. And that no longer exists. So teaching them to be good you know, remote workers on Zoom and collaborate asynchronously using Google Classroom, I mean, that's, that's what we do as workers. So why wouldn't they be doing it as students? This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by ClockShark. ClockShark is the leading GPS, time tracking, and scheduling system built for local construction and field service companies that wants a simpler way to track time, run payroll, and understand job costs. With the capabilities of crew tracking, scheduling, job site geofencing, teams and project segmentation, automatic labor allocation, budgeting, and reporting, ClockShark has built a robust mobile time tracking system to handle the unique challenges that face your clients. With ClockShark, your clients can keep accurate records like overtime, paid time off, unpaid time, hours per job and task, as well as the crucial data needed for certified payroll. With the integrations ClockShark has, you'll be able to connect to one of many ADP payroll platforms through ADP Marketplace and process payroll in minutes with a click of a button. ClockShark's pricing starts at just $6 a month per employee. Head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash ClockShark. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C-L-O-C-K-S-H-A-R-K. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by BQE Core. As firms everywhere are positioning themselves to work remotely, BQE Software is committed to supporting you and your employees during this critical time. BQE's core products operate 100% on a native cloud platform that's uniquely able to help you in your efforts to embrace remote work while maintaining your productivity. In response to the impact that COVID-19 has had on your firm and your clients' businesses, the team at BQE has let us know that the Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners will now receive three months of BQE Core for free with an annual subscription package purchased on or before September 30th, 2020. To learn more, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash core. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash C-O-R-E. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. Uh, So David, I had two virtual experiences this week. Two virtual experiences? I only had one. Well, who wants to go first? Well, you can go first because one of my virtual experiences was trying to have a virtual experience with you. Oh, all right. So then I think we're talking about the same thing. So it was the uh, Boomer Virtual Summit this week, Sunday through Wednesday. It was a virtual conference on the Verbella platform, which is like a video game. You walk around with an avatar and you can talk to people and it automatically turns your mic on so people can hear you when you're in proximity to them. We had a virtual booth. People went to sessions, like walked. You actually walk in the virtual world from the expo hall into your sessions and into the main hall, expo hall. Very interesting. Apparently you could drive a boat and you could also play soccer, but I never made it out of the expo hall. Just like in real life, I never got to go enjoy anything. Well, yeah, I asked you to give me an invite and I was like, all right, I'm going to jump in and do this. And I just got too busy. So I finally jumped in, I think Wednesday night, <laughs> late, and nobody was there. So it was just like in this world by myself. And my daughter walks by, she's like, what are you doing? She, I can make a, vi- I'm telling on you, you're playing video games in there. But it's just like a virtual world. Like there was a fireworks going off. I could explore and climb up to the top of a, a tower. I was on the soccer field. I went everywhere. Because it took me a long time to find the expo hall. Because that's all I wanted to see is I walked around and looked at it. But there was nobody else in the world when I was there. 100% <laughs> ghost land. But it was still kind of cool to run around. But it has those same video game problems. Like when sometimes you get to the edge of a map or it has like hills. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm going to run down the side of this hill and I get stuck. And then I got to like go around so you get out of it. So, it, yeah, it was a very roadblocks or Fortnite type of experience. Yeah, it was, in, it was interesting. It was unique. And I think, uh, you know, I'm curious – how, how the attendees liked it, but it seemed to go well. It was definitely better than you know sitting on a Zoom call all day long, uh, like some conferences. The part um, I couldn't grasp, I guess, was so 
because people's booths were there, right. right? And some of the booths had some static images you had in the booth. Then some parts of the booth almost looked like it was a presentation or a slide deck. Yes. Now, is that something I would walk up and press play and just sit there and watch and I would hear it through my headphones? Like, I didn't know. How, no, like, no, how, no. Do, how do you present something at a conference like this? So we were at the booth and you would walk in and then we could advance those slides or share our screen onto that main screen in the booth, just like you were at a conference. Okay. So that was actually worked pretty well. And then I think I went to some room that had big round tables in it. They were like hot zones. And so if I sat at that table, I could actually just talk to the people at that table, like at a real conference. Yes. It would create an audio uh, channel just for the people in that space. So Cool. Yeah. So that was the virtual experience on the work side. And then my son had his first week of kindergarten this week. And school is not back physically in session, but they, they tried to do it via Zoom, Scottsdale Unified School District. I did not have high expectations given that he's in kindergarten and I can't imagine that his kindergarten teacher has spent a lot of time using Zoom. So they spent most of the time learning how to unmute, mute, switch from speaker view to gallery view, like all the basic Zoom stuff. And Thomas learned it really fast. So I was joking that now he's better at being a remote worker than 75% of American office workers. (laughs) He knows how to mute and unmute himself on a conference call. Well, I think I think you saw posted something on Facebook, but like, it's a testament. He was just so excited to be first day of kindergarten, even though it was remote. Like he didn't yeah. care. He was just so excited about being, and it kind of put some perspective, yeah, you know, on that whole thing. It, it, children are so adaptable, and they don't have preconceived notions about the way things are supposed to be. So for him, he was really excited to get on Zoom with his classmates and learn, and he was paying attention. They obviously didn't do it the whole day. It was like two hours a day because that's the most you can ask kids to sit in front of a screen at this age. Like that's a lot. Yeah. Although they've been trained by having devices. Yeah. Yeah. That's all they do is sit in front of screens. So so actually like all that screen time we gave him by being bad parents, we were actually good parents because he was able to sit in front of the screen. And, uh, you know, he was so happy because he's seen mom and dad do Zoom calls and now he's doing them too. So he feels like he's growing up. He's happy. So it was an inspiration to me, like, Let's try to get rid of our preconceived notions and let's be open to this. And uh, it was it was good. He did his homework. You know, he he learned some stuff. That's all we can ask for, especially in kindergarten. Now, for the older kids, I think it's a little bit harder because there's like academic stuff they got to learn, right? You know, if you're in like second, third grade, I'd be a little more concerned. The schools, you know, you're either the school district kind of were either Google, there's like Google School or they call it, or it's the Microsoft Teams platform, right? That's kind of the two platforms all the school district and schools are using. Yep. You're either one or the other. But really now thinking about it, like after experiencing that virtual world at the Boomer Conference, like why are they not using that for these kids? They could go out, they could go and play and goof out around a little bit in an area. They could pretend to go outside with their friends. They get to sit at a table and talk to their friends only. Like yeah. it just seems to make so much more sense. Yeah, actually, that's a like, great like, idea. Just create a virtual school. Yeah. Like why are no, why is nobody doing that? It, it would be, it's actually, if I had to guess, the kids would embrace that way better than accountants and bookkeepers would. Uh, you're right, actually. That's a brilliant idea. And and all those kids like of a certain age, like what, eight through 12 are playing Minecraft? So like that, that's the whole 3D virtual world is completely like yeah, natural to them. In this, they can sit at the table with your it. friends yeah. at the table and you instantly get a microphone connection. You can talk to them and you can yeah, walk yeah. away and, you know, maybe there's areas outside and, you know, it's got guns and all, the, you know, all the typical video game stuff, right? <laughs> like the typical video guns. Game stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the, you know, that's one of the things that we don't have in yes. virtual yeah. school that I think but is you know a good what I mean? thing, Like right? there's other stuff, there's things to do. <laughs> I don't know. It'd be, it's, it's just, it's interesting, right? Um, where, <laughs> you know, the schools are basically yes. putting, they're turning kids into little corporate worlds, right? We're on Microsoft Teams and all your work is in here yeah. and upload your documents here. And then in the meantime, we're doing conferences with us playing yeah, in a Fortnite well, environment. If you think about it, really, going virtual is forcing the schools to adapt to the new world of work. The The traditional education where you sit at a desk and you have a bell that rings every hour is based on the factory model. And it was designed to teach children to be good little factory workers someday. And that no longer exists. So teaching them to be good you know, remote workers on Zoom and collaborate asynchronously using Google Classroom, I mean, that's... That's what we do as workers. So why wouldn't they be doing it as students? That's right. So we're training them early now. Anyway. We should probably get to the news, huh? Let me go through my highlights. Big Commerce and Intuit. Intuit tried to buy Big Commerce, but then they went public and that was really crazy. What else do I got? Oh, we have to talk about the Trump payroll tax deferral. We kind of skipped that last week because it had just happened. 
But I, I want to talk about that and the executive action there and the questions that accountants have. And we should talk about some fraud stories. I got some follow up on Wirecard and also the NRA is now involved in a lawsuit about financial fraud. I, I got fraud. We have uh, Michael Mann in my parallel HR yes. back in the news. The one I think that doesn't fit in, but it does fit in. So TikTok, everybody wants to ban TikTok. Well, not everybody, but like Trump wants to ban TikTok, right? And I, I don't know why. I, I'm trying to understand why Treasury Secretary Mnuchin is weighing in on this. Like he officially like went on CNBC and he came out against the social media sharing app. Really? Like, I, I just, what, what was his argument? Well, well, he said that President Trump has decided it cannot allowed to go on as it's been. And I get it. Fine. If Trump's administration and Trump wants to go after it. and But I just don't know where, where the treasury fits into this. So the reason that the Trump administration is concerned with TikTok is because, and this is a legitimate concern, the app is owned by a Chinese company and it aggressively collects data on American citizens. Like when you load TikTok, and there, there have been people who have said, you know, before all of this happened, independent security researchers saying, do not install TikTok because it is mining your data, like worse than Facebook even. And, and, it's, a, and it's owned basically arguably by the Chinese Communist Party, essentially. Right. Well, yeah. because maybe that's a little aggressive way to put it, but like every company in China that's big enough, like if, if the Chinese government asks them for data, they're going to give it to them, right? It's an authoritarian country. So yeah, that's a big concern and that's legit. Uh, and the Treasury Department, has a committee on foreign investment in the US. And that is the committee that has the power, an incredible amount of power to force a business to either stop doing um, business in the US, like a foreign business, or to be sold like this, uh, Microsoft situation. So this does roll up to him then. He does have sort of staying control. Of yeah. Okay. It's part of, it's a, it's a committee in his department that has the power to, to regulate foreign businesses uh, like this. Yeah. Um, and they can basically force TikTok to either stop doing business or to sell. I'm actually uh, – And it's a national security thing. Mnuchin and uh, the SBA as well didn't uh, jump on TikTok to communicate and release everything about all those PPP guidance things they keep releasing on Friday nights. They could have just done it on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? So you want to talk about app news? Yeah, why, why not? There's a lot. So we talked last week about how Intuit has agreed to purchase TradeGecko, the Singapore e-commerce company. But apparently, before that, they were going after Big Commerce. This was a report in CNBC. That's where I saw it first. Uh, and Big Commerce just went public. They had their IPO. They're an e-commerce platform that targets a lot of medium-sized businesses. They've kind of gone up market since they started as a small business e-commerce platform. And I guess the big news out of the IPO was that they just popped way up from their uh, initial price. Yeah, they're up 200%. And so Intuit, I guess, tried to buy them before that, right? They yeah, tried to buy them. And it looked like some um, internal leaders at Big Commerce did want to take the deal. Uh, but the um, founder really pushed or the CEO pushed against it and took the big gamble because if Shopify is out there, right? And Shopify has been kind of the darling over the last four years. Mm -hmm. And so combined with the amazing run Shopify has had on, on Wall Street and then combine that with so many more people because of the pandemic or shopping online, uh, he kind of really took the bet and said, you know what, we're going to go and IPO instead. And I bet he and the other investors are really glad they did that because the market cap as of the close of the market on Friday, August 14th was over $5 billion. So it's now valued at 45 times revenue and into its offer of 1.5 billion was only 11 times revenue. So they basically made four times as much money versus the acquisition, like on paper anyway. Yeah. And the more I'd like to think about, but it was Intuit sniffing in this a little bit, right? Um, looking at big commerce and trying to go down that path. And it really strikes me with um, what Hector Garcia, like text, he, he sent me a text or whatever, or Facebook message, you know, four or five weeks ago, like this whole Shopify concept of Shopify buying an accounting platform and specifically FreshBooks because they're both neighbors essentially. And then you start thinking about how big Shopify is now, right? They're, they're 20 times bigger than big commerce. And, and they're still growing faster than big commerce. So it's, um, it, it, it really is like, okay, if Intuit's interested acquiring, hey, we need to have a full e-commerce suite underneath, our, underneath our, our accounting app. It makes me wonder, well, 
you know, obviously nobody's going to buy Shopify at this point, but it does make sense for Shopify to buy an accounting system. And so this just keeps every day is like constantly in my head. Like at least once I think about it, like, yeah. like it, that's going to be game changing if that happens. So your theory is into it is worried about a threat from Shopify expanding into accounting since it already handles pretty much everything else for e-commerce sellers. That's why Intuit is interested in big, big commerce. It didn't achieve that, but it got trade gecko. I mean, even if they don't integrate it into QuickBooks, it's a good investment because e-commerce is growing so much right now. And Shopify, by the way, is bigger than Intuit. I don't know if people realize that. In terms of market cap, Shopify is at $119 billion and Intuit's around $80 billion. So like, put that in perspective. I don't think most accountants are aware of just how massive Shopify is now. Yeah, I mean, Shopify is starting to become a threat to Amazon. That's how big Shopify is at this point. You're, you're not even, they probably look at big commerce and laugh now. I <laughs> mean, maybe like, ah, it's just big commerce. Like, because they used to be kind of identical and they were almost at equal footing before. And Shopify is just completely taken off. It, it, I think a lot of this comes down to, especially into its motivation, is owning the customer. Whoever owns the customer is going to win. And if the customer is spending 12 hours a day inside of Shopify running their business, they're not in front of Intuit. They might still use QuickBooks. They might be a QuickBooks customer, but ultimately, they're not spending their time there, which means now you can't push a loan product on them. Shopify loans is going to be more successful. Shopify will have a bank. This is all about like owning the customer. And you're seeing like Intuit is really... Every time you turn around, they're buying another app from the ecosystem. Right. You you want to be a business management platform, not an accounting platform, because or a bank. Yeah, you don't want to be a bank either. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be a bank. And, well, and l- so let's talk about banking. Square is continuing to push into this banking world in their cash app, the app that you can use to you know as a c- consumer pay people money, get paid. They now have a feature that allows users to borrow up to two hundred dollars. I can in the app borrow 200 bucks and then pay it back over time, like a payday loan, right? But it's- It's exactly a payday loan. You can get as low as $20. It's about 60% APR if you work out the fees, but that is lower than your average payday loan. Which I think pushed in the 300% range, right? there. I think with this low amount of $200, they're testing the waters and they could easily offer more, right? And they know so much about their users. They see the whole payment history. They could probably- very easily increase that amount. And then like you said last week, they're also going into the business. So they're going to start letting people use Cash App for business transactions. Yep. People have been doing it informally, but now it's going to be formally business. And I think then why not let people borrow 2000 20000 depending on their credit worthiness, right? Oh, I can see the connection to that. And really, if you look at there's a Australian um, startup called Afterpay that's starting to roll out in the US. But essentially... Um, it's it's finance, right? So you want to buy that fancy guitar, Blake, and you go there to the uh, guitar shop to buy it, but it costs two thousand dollars. And they offer, hey, you can uh, after pay, and somehow you use after pay to pay for it, and then you have a loan installment pay payments, after. right? It's kind of installment payments, yeah. But but it's kind of the way it's done. It's it's done at the point of sale almost instantly. Where and I haven't seen it or used it, but it totally makes sense, right? You're going to go to pay for something at a Square Cash register. It's going to be expensive and boom, you can, your Square app is going to give you the option to, to finance it yep. instantly. There's a payment service that's targeted towards CPA firms that I've seen that does this where you can offer your customers the ability to to um, pay in installments and they'll take on the risk of this. So this is like a big popular thing for big purchases. I can't remember the name of that. What is what is that app? So it's quick fee. So they sponsored us, if you remember before, when they, when they came oh, to the okay, US that's launch. Kind of. And yeah, essentially what they do is instead of you having to like – you know, create an installment agreement with your client and keep track and get them to finish paying you and chase the money. The quick fee will just give you the money and then they'll handle chasing that down and set up the the payment structure with the client. So like yeah, so quick fee is very specifically focused on accountants and I think they're going after lawyers a little bit. But like this the cash app and these types of services are really for yep. retail point right there at point of purchase. On the same line of thinking with the apps becoming banks, Gusto sent me an email it's a feature called cash reserve. And I had to actually log into Gusto to see what this looked like, to see the information about it. It is a feature where an employee can choose to have a percentage or a set amount withheld from their paycheck every pay period and put into a bank account that Gusto manages for them with a partner bank. It is a bank called NBKC Bank. And it's 
FDIC insured. They can transfer the balance into their other accounts whenever they need it. Interest of 0.45%, unlimited transfers. You can create and track personalized goals. It's called cash reserve. All right. So I, I have a company, I have employees, and I've been writing them checks. And now they're like, I don't really don't want checks anymore, but I don't have a bank. You could just be like, hey, good news. You're just going to get an instant bank through payroll. It's going to automatically set up for you. And here's your debit card. And you you, you just got a bank. Every app's going to offer a bank service here soon it, because it's all the, the APIs, the banks, Visa, MasterCard, they, they've they all set this up in very easy ways for apps to build on top of these. So yeah, every app is going to have a feature of, we'll open a bank account for you. That's my prediction. We'll, every app's going to have a bank account. We'll, we'll stop talking about this because it won't be news soon. Like every app's going to have its own bank account built in. Some news from the UK. Free Agent has launched a service called Copilot in the UK. It looks like QuickBooks Live. An expert accountant right by your side in Free Agent. Copilot is a revolutionary way of working with an accountant directly within Free Agent. So apparently you work with this certified accountant directly in the app. They will help you manage it and you'll get their expert advice. You're you're assigned a Copilot accountant, so it sounds like it's not a team approach. You actually get somebody. It's very, very, very cheap for zero to two employees. If you're a sole trader, it's like 30 to 45 pounds a month. And if you're a limited company, it's 60 to 75. This is really cheap. It like caps out at 75 pounds a month. I'm curious if any of the accountants in the UK who listen are threatened by this or if it's just not something they're too worried about. But it seems like really low pricing to get an accountant on demand. It's interesting because I think Intuit this week I saw just rolled out. They kind of raised the level of connecting with your accountant and connect and getting support kind of at a higher level on QuickBooks Online. I know on, on Facebook, some people and Twitter, some people got a little upset about it. But in the grand scheme of things, like even with all the news and, and how much Intuit's pushing QuickBooks Live, I'm really not hearing this massive exodus of people leaving their bookkeepers and accountants that they already have to go to QuickBooks Live. So you're right. It may be... People getting more upset about this than they really need to be. It, maybe it is really a non-issue, but they definitely moved it up in the uh, the menu to make it more uh, more easier to get to. Uh, I have a couple more articles on apps if you want to jump into those. Just a couple quick ones. FreshBooks is launching a mileage tracking app. So just like QuickBooks did two years ago. So you can get a FreshBooks mileage tracking app. Um, which is interesting because that tells me FreshBooks is now, you know, move because they, at their sweet spot used to be a lot of people that just did like professional service. Like mm-hmm. I'm a website designer, things like that. So this means that they're starting to get people that, you know, have to do things in person more possibly and they need to track that mileage. They're so, expanding out. Yeah. They're expanding out. Um, Routable. So Routable does like uh, B2B payments, services and um, accounts payable um, automation type services. So they just mm-hmm. took a 16 million, uh, they took a $12 million round and now they've raised 16 million overall. But I thought it was interesting is their quote from their um, founder, it's really clear where they're going. So he really talks about, you know, sending a thousand business payments a month is different than somebody sending 10,000 or a hundred thousand. And you know, they're, they, the rest of his quotes, like, you know, finance desert, finance departments deserve the best software and the support as they scale. So it's very clear routables going up market, right? They're going for teams of people that need to automate thousands of bill payments a month. One thing that amazes me about the B2B payment space is just how much competition there is in there. It seems like there are just dozens and dozens of options for payments. <laughs> like, why is that? I guess it's just such a big market, right? But and I get, you know, maybe everybody... in the app space, though, it's not just that. I mean, forecasting and dashboard apps, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> like, 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 every slice of the market has like 70 or 80 competitors. It's crazy. Zero has released chart of accounts templates in Zero HQ. So this is for accountants only, it looks like. So I, I logged into my Zero HQ and I saw there are now templates for C Corps, S Corps, legal, LLCs, not for profits, partnerships, retail, services, and sole proprietors. So when I create a Zero account, I can select one of these, just like the old QuickBooks desktop. Very uh, additions, right? Yeah. I can select a chart of accounts for that those industries and apply that and then customize further. And people have always like, that's always been a best practice. Like you get your templates and you have those ready to go and you import them into QuickBooks. Oh. I mean, people have been doing this for years. Um, but yeah, for, you know, you're right. Like why isn't the accounting software just provide it? Like, yes, exactly. That was one of my number one ingredients in my secret sauce was when I had my practice was I had some really good templates set up. So we kept those in like a CSV file and we could import them. 
into zero and it made things so much easier. The thing I don't like about this, and I hope they add it, is you can't customize this at the practice level. They're just locked in place. So if you don't like them, you have to then customize them every single time for your clients. So maybe give accounting firms the ability to create a custom version of this and then have it available at the practice level for people to install. Because if, if they don't do that, then ultimately we're still going to have to do this like CSV file upload. We've talked about in the past Revolut. They are the online bank that kind of started in Europe and has been rolling out and now they're starting to come to the States. But they had they spun out, they have a business division, a Revolut business. And they said they have now partnered with Bullet. It's a accounting software AI powered accounting software. It's an Irish company in Ireland. So they're basically, here it is. It's like one of the new banks. They know they need accounting software, right? So you're starting to see it. There's just another example of this that basically they're going to uh, help the Revolut business customers reduce their tax bills and automate their company accounts. And it's just uh, another a bank play. Essentially, it's a new bank. It's not a traditional bank, but they're making a play at accounting services. Um, yeah, I, that- I wonder how. I wonder how Revolut is doing in the pandemic because I spotted a story um, this week about how their losses tripled in 2019 due to their rapid expansion. They had a loss of 139.6 million for the year ending December 31st, uh, which is up uh, significantly from 2018. And it was hard to read those articles. Like they just blame everything on growth. So it's hard to know, like, is this a real issue that they're down? Or is it just they're they're growing in too many directions too fast and just blowing money? And the data is so stale. I guess this is because of the pandemic that we're only getting this uh, 2019 you know financial information in August. I three like, times I kept going back and looking at the article. Is this really a, an article from this week? I did that three yeah. times <laughs> on the news. Okay, good. It's not well, just me who questioned that. We talked a little bit about um, on deck getting acquired last week, and we. There was a hint or rumor or something about Cabbage, but it looks like American Express now is definitely in advanced talks to buy Cabbage for just under a billion dollars. American Express would then become a huge lender to mom and pop shops that they already are the largest U.S. provider of credit cards at those same shops. So you basically, you get your credit card from your business credit card from Amex, and then now you start taking loans from them. Interesting. Interesting. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by ADP Marketplace. How can you be a more trusted advisor for your clients as they face new challenges? By recommending solutions from ADP Marketplace, ADP's digital HR storefront. With ADP Marketplace, clients can try, buy, and implement highly rated HR apps that can share data with ADP. With secure data integrations, it's easy to streamline HR processes and adapt to new business needs. Help your clients discover new ways to recruit and onboard employees, boost performance, offer unique financial wellness benefits, and much more. And with integrations for popular business software like Expensify, PayActive, Slack, and ClockShark, clients can add value to the tools they already use by simply and securely connecting them to ADP. Have clients in field service or construction? ClockShark can help them track time to quickly and accurately run payroll, all integrated with ADP. Visit ADP Marketplace at apps.adp.com or right from your Accountant Connect dashboard. Not set up with Accountant Connect? Sign up today. It's free. Head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash ADP. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash ADP. ADP as your back with ADP Marketplace. Well, that's it for App News. Let's talk about politics, David. Let's talk about economics, payroll tax, the Trump executive actions. As our listeners undoubtedly know, Congress has been at a stalemate over further stimulus. Uh, They can't come to an agreement on unemployment. They can't come to an agreement on bailouts for states. Nothing. They're just stuck. And so President Trump issued executive actions that have been controversial, to say the least. There is the unemployment insurance executive action where he has reallocated money from uh, the pandemic to provide $300 uh, in additional weekly benefits if the states also contribute $100. So there's that. But the big issue I want to talk about is the payroll tax deferral. Starting September 1st, so in 15 days, we're still very hazy on the details. Employees are going to have the option to defer their payroll taxes until some unspecified date. That is how this executive action is working. It's not actually cutting the payroll tax. It's just saying to the Treasury Department and the IRS, allow employees to not 
pay their payroll tax and they'll still owe it because the president doesn't have the power, according to the Constitution, to just cut a tax. Congress has to do that. So he can change though the collection date. So it's just going to be deferred indefinitely and then collected at some later date. And I guess the strategy here is that Congress will then decide to forgive this and actually cut the tax and people won't have to pay it back. But what if they don't do that? So employers are worried. The Wall Street Journal had an article about how employers are wary that they could be on the hook for these payroll taxes because employers are on the hook for uncollected employee payroll taxes. Like it's a it's a huge liability. Uh, if you don't do it, you can be personally held responsible and it can follow you forever as a business owner. So the question is like, what's going to happen if an employee uh, leaves the company or, you know, gets terminated or something, anything like who's going to be on the hook for paying these taxes? There's questions about like, when are they going to have to pay it back? Because there's actually not a deadline. And so the AICPA sent a letter on Wednesday asking Assistant Treasury Secretary David Coucher and IRS Commissioner Charles Reddick to provide guidance to address these concerns. Who's an eligible employee? Does the $4,000 limit apply separately to each employer of an employee or is it collective? Because if it's collective, I don't know how they're supposed to figure that out. So, so instead um, of- How are the employees going to pay back those taxes? It's like a huge ambiguous mess and it's all supposed to start in two weeks. So instead of an employee taking initiative, getting a W-4 form and saying they have 99 dependents and turning that in and then basically getting no taxes with, without from their paycheck, they're kind of making this to where from a, from a media and marketing play where now – Employers are just going to go to their employers and be like, I don't want to pay taxes. And the employers can be like, all right, I guess I'll turn it off or I'll, right? Like, or I'll change it to zero every week on your paycheck. But ultimately, you're right. If there's not another ruling, you're just kicking the can down the road and you're going to have to owe those taxes when you file at the end of the year. Right. If Congress doesn't act to forgive this, then the tax is still owed. And so then there's the question of, well, are we going to be in the situation around Christmas time when employees don't get a check because they haven't been paying payroll taxes and now it's all got to be paid back all at once? And and again, like the big question is who's on the hook for the taxes if something happens to that employee, if they leave, like who who is going to pay back these taxes? Is the employer going to be held responsible? Because that's the way the law is right now, is employers are responsible for uh, withholding this tax and, pay, and, and remitting it to the government. So, I mean, just the implementation of this, I feel so sorry for two groups of people. One, the accountants who are manually doing this for their clients, because there's a lot of firms that still do payroll and they do it the traditional way, you know, calculating it for and doing all the forms and I feel bad for them. Or there's business owners who do that still. And then the payroll services, you know, the ADPs, the paychecks, the gustos, the the ripplings have to figure out suddenly in a very short amount of time how to put in a mechanism for employees to opt into this, for employers to opt into this, for the taxes to be deferred, for that to be tracked, for it to be repaid. I mean, what a what a disaster this is going to be. Well, I mean, I think ultimately this is a bigger disaster of our leadership in DC. And it's it's really, if you really step back and look at this, this is just small businesses being the stuck in the middle of this um battle. Pandemic relief, right? And and now because you know they're they can't come to an agreement because the pandemic bill has all this other stuff in it. There was an article in Politico about the Paycheck Protection Program. So there's some small revisions that are they think everybody agrees on in the Paycheck Protection Program they want to put in, but it's stuck in the middle of the stupid bigger bill that the small business owners aren't getting the relief they need and the guidance they need. And the same thing with this, right? They Because yeah. of them having a stalemate, Trump does his executive order and then small business owners are now caught in that. But things like um, the automatic grant, essentially if your PPP loan is $150,000, right. they pretty much agree on that. Like That's just stuck in this bigger discussion about – the Democrats want a $3 billion package and... Yeah, they're at like $3.5 billion and the Republicans are at a billion and they can't meet in the middle. It's yeah. like they, they can't... And, and the one of the big sticking points is that, you know, relief for state governments and, 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 all, and they're not getting anywhere. And the one thing they're all agreement in on a little bit is the PPP stuff. <laughs> and they can't get that out the door because it's stuck now and all the other stuff. So again, small business owners are getting screwed. And um, not only that, the banks are very aware of this now. So some of the banks are discouraging clients from rushing to file their applications, even though the SBA started accepting the applications on Monday. And, oh, yeah. And a, a vice president or vice chairman, Synthony Blakemanship of Bank of the West, she said, they are encouraging our customers to wait for any possible congressional action that might streamline the forgiveness process. So they just are basically telling their customers, don't apply for forgiveness. 
I'm saying to everyone, just wait as long as possible <laughs> to do this because it's going to change. There's, and you don't want to have d- done all this work and then have to redo it. Can you refresh my memory on one thing here? So there's an article in the CNBC and it's talking about how uh, owners that took the PPP loan and the $10,000 emergency loan grant, the EIDL, yeah. that apparently like that 10000 goes against your PPP loan, right? And so it's, it's not like you get your PPP loan and you get another ten grand forgivable, right? You can't combine the whole thing. It's, it's, and I think from day one, it's always been like that. But the way this article, you know, it, it's acting like this is a surprise to small business owners now. But I feel like if, if, if any communications about these two loans has been clear is you can't have both. Right, one's going to offset the other one, but apparently small business owners now are confused by this, and and the article's really written up that this is some sort of surprise being popped on everybody now. Well, you know, this stuff's complicated. I mean, maybe yeah. it doesn't seem that way if you've been living it like we have, but like if you're a small business owner, you're not listening to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I mean, if you are, that's great. Thank you for listening, but you know, most aren't, right? <laughs> it's yeah. just not. They're not interested in the technical details of compliance and and all this stuff. So. It's way too complicated. Um, what else do we got here in the politics world? The Trump administration is urging delisting of U.S. listed Chinese firms that fail to meet audit standards. David, you know I don't agree with the Trump administration on a lot of stuff, but I'm I'm on board with this. This is really interesting. We talked about Luckin Coffee, that massive three hundred million dollar fraud, at least that in China, with that you know startup that was challenging Starbucks, and it turned out that they were faking. $300 million in revenue with essentially what were gift cards that never got used or were never even sold. Well, part of the reason that kind of stuff happens is because audit requirements in China are not nearly as strict as they are here. And so the Trump administration is saying, if you want to be listed on a US stock exchange and you're a Chinese company, you need to submit to inspection by US regulators. And the idea being, hey, let's actually make sure that companies are on an equal footing. U.S. companies have to uh, abide by GAAP. Chinese companies should have to do so as well and, and have rigorous audits. So I thought that was really interesting. Big news in the international audit world if that actually comes to be. I mean, that's ultimately the problem and we can transition over to Wirecard, right? Is Yeah, yeah, let's talk about I don't fraud. Know if it, I don't know yeah. if it was completely like a lack of standards, but it was a lack of quality auditing. Oh, <laughs> yeah. They didn't even bother to do bank confirmations, like the most basic audit technique in the book is send a letter to the bank, make sure that those accounts are real and the the amounts are accurate as of the date of the financial statements. Yeah. They didn't even do that. So just like Trump saying that those companies can't be listed on on a US exchange, the DAX index, which is like the German blue chip index, they haven't made Mm -hmm. a ruling now. They're going to start taking out insolvent companies out of that. So they're going to be dropped from the DAX index on where a card will be. But did you see the other wire card news? Well, there's quite a bit that I've saved up because okay. we haven't talked about it for a few weeks. Maybe you're going to talk about this. Jan Marsalek, he has fled to Russia. Did we talk about this? Well, we, he was missing, but now you've tracked him down, Blake? You you have him? Well, I, I mean, I didn't track him down, but this newsletter that I subscribed to <laughs> tracked him down, apparently. So he was thought to have been in the Philippines. That is not true. Apparently, they were faking that so they could find out if he had an Interpol record, which would get him arrested at the border. So then after, this is all speculation, but after um, he had somebody run an immigration check in the Philippines, he went to Russia. And apparently he has brought significant sums of money into the country in the form of Bitcoin from Dubai. And he's like hiding out in Russia with the help of the GRU, Russia's military intelligence agency. <laughs> he's got like a private house in Moscow and stuff. And so now now Interpol is trying to find him and get him out of Russia. But, you know, good luck with that, right? Well, and I tell the article I had, he's now on Interpol's red notice list. So he's, he's one of okay. the most wanted criminals by Interpol. That's amazing. So, and by the way, the reason this guy is so wanted, he's the COO who was in charge of the third party relationships that are at the heart of the $2 billion fraud. He's only like 40 years old. He joined the company when he was 20 and he's he's been there the whole time, made it up to COO as they grew and um, ha- has this reputation for just like dropping insane amounts of money in restaurants. He like sounds like a, a typical like tech, you know. Well, what's well, not tech. It's a typical criminal. The, um, all these guys, <laughs> all the, the uh, it's all the same thing. You hear about these crazy cocaine parties they were doing. They, these oh, guys, yeah, yeah, they yeah. steal this money and they just go crazy. So, but here's your conspiracy hat. So... Another former executive of Wirecard who lived in the Philippines, younger guy, 44 years old, he conveniently died July 27th in the hospital in the Philippines due to natural causes. 
just yeah, right. conveniently. Yeah, right. And so he basically, him and his wife ran like a, a tour bus company and another company called Pay Easy. And mm. they were involved in some of this moving the money around stuff. They're tied to this, even though they, he would downplay. He's like, I'm not, I don't have any influence. I'm not on the board. I don't do any of the day-to-day management. It's very like, but they're investing in their part, part of the investigation. And it's, I just find it interesting. You know, he just happens to die of natural causes. So one last piece of string to add to our board of conspiracies around <laughs> Wirecard. Oh okay. Visualize this. Guess who invested a billion dollars last year in Wirecard? SoftBank? Yes. Our favorite, SoftBank. I mean, they seem to come up in every single like bad story we've got. There's like a SoftBank investment. I mean, either they're throwing so much money around there in every, everything or they're just making really bad decisions. So yeah, they invested a billion dollars last year, which apparently helped to quiet investor concerns about Wirecard before the collapse. So think about this. It's a $2 billion fraud, right? $2 billion are missing and Wirecard. And SoftBank gave them a billion dollars right before this all went down. So, like, they're on the hook for, you know, half of this. Speaking of frauds, you want to talk about my payroll HR or do we still have more wire card fraud? <laughs> no, no. Let's let's talk about my payroll HR. Let's go to a small, relatively small fraud. Um, what's new with our friend Michael Mann? Yeah. So, uh, for those of you who may be new to the show, if you go back, uh, this was last September, October timeframe, I think. Uh, yeah. All of a sudden, there's reports around the country that people's paychecks were being s- opposite withdrawn from their their bank accounts. Yeah. So, yep. so and sometimes like Friday. two times. Yeah. yeah. And then the company pulled the paycheck back out of your bank account. And this is a domino effect. So the company that moved the money around, um, cache financial services, they're the ones that would deposit the money in your bank account. So they, they provide that service, right. As for payroll companies. Well, they had the money taken out of their account. So they panicked and started taking out of other people's accounts to recover their $16 million. Now, they basically had to go bankrupt. But this is all a domino tied to this one guy, Michael Mann, who he, had, he ran a payroll service. Well, that was right? one of his many fraudulent things, right? So he had a payroll service and it's just a dominoed and he basically committed $100 million of fraud. And the dominoes have just impacted the amount of people that have gone bankrupt or had mm. to be folded now because of this. He was actually in court this week and he pled guilty. The um, Times Union has a really good uh, article that breaks down the whole web of it. We don't have to cover the whole thing here. It's 12 pages of this this web wow. and the breakdown of it in the document. And essentially, it was just creating fake documents, creating bogus companies. And then, But he had inside people at some of these other companies. And he was able to get like this 20-year-old kid. This 20-year-old kid's probably facing a 20-year prison sentence now. And he paid him off with $11,000 in Amazon gift cards. Like this guy's helping somebody, right? I mean, you think about it. Like, okay, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to help you create, I'm going to help you cover tens of millions of dollars of fraudulent invoices. I'm going to help you in this scheme. And I'm going to agree to $11,000 in Amazon gift cards. Like, like, <laughs> like not even a million bucks. Yeah, not like, yeah, not worth the risk. Yes. Yeah, definitely was, should ask for more money. Like, dumb, uh, it's that dumb criminals thing, right? Like, golly. So he's, he's going to jail. No. So going back up to larger frauds. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you'd heard that the NRA is being sued by the New York Attorney General. They are accused of, well, the executives, one executive in particular, CEO Wayne LaPierre, is accused of draining $64 million from the nonprofit in just three years. Regardless of how you feel about gun rights, like let's separate that. This is a not for profit that is supposed to advocate for people who believe in gun rights. So setting aside the politics, they should be exercising fiduciary responsibility for this money that people are donating, right? Well, the accusation is that uh, LaPierre was making a ton of personal expenses. And the way he did it was he had their PR agency spend the money, buy him tickets. Um, He went to the Bahamas on private jets. He went to Europe, uh, all sorts of like crazy stuff. Like I said, $64 million, right? And then the PR company or the advertising agency, whatever you want to call them, would invoice the NRA like a one-line invoice with no detail and the NRA would pay it. So just the fact that that was happening, if that in fact was happening, right? This is alleged. I mean, that just is shady, right? Like if, if these expenses were legitimate, then you would simply expense them as normal. You would not route them through your PR agency, right? So that, that uh, to me indicates that there's something shady going on here. It's kind of crazy. Like this is such a huge influential organization and it could be taken down by really what is a, you know, I mean, not petty, but um, just like expense report fraud, essentially by the, by the president of the organization. 
is the NRA a, a are they a nonprofit or do they have I'm assuming yeah, you have a board, right? Like who's like? Well, and that's the thing is, so there has been a lot of infighting apparently in the board. Uh, I think it was Oliver North was the president of the board, and he was forced out by Lapierre after he pressed for an internal financial review. So they've uh, been okay. arguing about this quietly, and now it has blown into public view. So criminal charges. Okay, so this is this is this is not this is not a uh, a political showing a political hunt. They. This was already had, they had had problems internally, and now they're just coming to light to everybody else now. Interesting. Yeah, and the state of New York is pressing to dissolve them completely. Like that's how bad this could be. It could be like Trump's charity, right, where they they completely dissolve them. Um, of course, they could just reconstitute in another state and everything. But this could look really bad for Lapierre. And actually, the the where they could get them is the income taxes, because if you benefit from like personal expenses through your business. If you if you spend money in your business and it's personal in nature, not business expenses, that is personal income to you if the business pays for it, right? And you're supposed to report that on your taxes. So if there's like millions of dollars of uh, benefit that he got, then that's income and he didn't report it. So he could be on the hook for like tax evasion and stuff like that. That's where they end up getting these guys. So anyway, just wanted to bring that up. I thought that was interesting. And I guess the lesson here is, you know, if you are auditing is look for these kind of things because it's a very, um, I think, kind of a classic way to hide uh, expenses to commit fraud is you have a third party pay for something and then bill your company for it, right? You benefit from that payment. It's not a business expense. And then it looks like one though, because you know your accounts payable team is getting an invoice from your PR agency that looks totally legit and they pay it. Should we wrap up on an awesome feel good story? Yeah. Well, and we also have a uh, listener voicemail that we oh, got to yeah. get to. Do you want to do the voicemail at first or do the list? Uh... Let's do that voicemail. So we actually have a number that you can call and you can leave us a message. And somebody did, believe it or not, in response to uh, the story last week uh, about hourly billing. Hey, Blake and David. My name is Will Akers. I am in Knoxville, Tennessee. Got a couple of partners that own a firm uh, in Knoxville with a couple hundred clients, a few dozen employees, and uh, just recently listening to your episode on yeah, when time-based pricing works, episode 187. Before I get into that, thanks for what you do, by the way. Love what you guys do. Um, really entertaining and love staying up to date with the news that you guys present, but I just have some thoughts on this. We're, we are a uh, remote-based firm, cloud accounting, 99.9% in, in cloud accounting software and and do everything on a recurring basis. We have more fixed fee if you twist my arm rather than value based. And so that's part of my voicemail and part of my question is I just want to ask the question, how do you guys differentiate between value versus uh, fixed fee? Because I feel like value is kind of in the eye of the holder. Kind of reminds me of like squares versus rectangles in the sense of all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. That would mean that all value based billing is fixed fee, but all fixed fee is not value based. You know, an example that you gave, I totally understand where he's coming from. I understand where you guys are coming from as well. But, um, but every now and then we run into projects where it's like we can't can't possibly know how big of a dumpster fire this is. And and we still try to fix – we still try to, to quote it. We don't bill by the hour. We don't do any of that. But it doesn't mean that it's not right. Like sometimes we come across those projects and it's, it's very scary to know that I price it right. And so anyway – this is an interesting conversation of like this, there's, there could be a blurry line between value and fix, and uh, it's really interesting to see what you guys think about. And we'd love to hear like when to use what well, number one, how you differentiate with it between those two. Thank you so much, Will, for listening. And and that's a really really great question: fixed versus value. What is the difference, David? I've got my opinions. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. I, I feel like in my brain, like fixed is. You know, you kind of packages like, you know, hey, pick one of these packages. Here's the services I'll provide you. And this is the fee, right? And you you, you kind of stick within that guideline. Mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, you're, you're buying the value meal number one at McDonald's. You're going to pay this much for it. And that's it. But I think of a value pricing, right, is really how much is that worth to me? So if, if I haven't ate in three days, McDonald's could probably charge me a lot more for that value meal. <laughs> it's going to have more value. Yeah. And so I, I kind of think like for me, when I think about like quoting a value price, really trying to figure out like not what my costs are, right? Almost like how much is it worth to them? And maybe, maybe you figure out what their costs are. Well, maybe they have to, if they want to do this thing, they'd have to hire two employees on their staff. Well, that means right there, it's worth $200,000 right. to them, right? But for a different company with a different cost structure, you know, maybe that number is different. 
right? Like maybe they're paying different salaries. I, I like, Will, what you said about all value pricing is fixed pricing, but not all fixed pricing is value pricing. And I think generally that is true, that a, a fixed price is we're setting the fee in advance and we're going to tell you the price in advance before we do the work. And that's very different than hourly billing where you may tell them your hourly rate, but you don't tell them what they're going to actually pay until after you have done the work and you present the bill. And in some cases, people will just do the work and not even tell the client the hourly rate. And then they're really surprised. So fixed fee is you set that in advance. And, and generally, I think it's the same for everybody. So that's the sort of thing where you could put it on your website. You could say, I charge $1,000 per month for this. And everyone who comes to me pays the same price. With a value price, you don't put that on your website because it could change for every customer, depending on the value that they place on it. So maybe it's the same set of services and you give a different price to different customers based on their ability to pay or their industry or the, the value that they perceive, right? And there's so many different ways that you could do it. And that's what makes it so hard. But value pricing isn't always fixed in that I might attach a percentage to a value pricing engagement where I could say like, if I increase your revenue by X dollars, I'm going to get 2% of that or 5% of that or something, right? Make it more like a... Uh, or it could be an equity play. Right. Equity. Right. It could yep. be... You can have your fixed fee for your base services you provide, but there's this whole extra stuff they really can't afford to pay you for. Maybe you exchange out equity and you, you're just helping them you know, grow through this. Yeah. So. And there's there, that's definitely not fixed, right? So uh, although I guess the percentage relationship is fixed, so I'm not sure if technically that would qualify, but... Yeah, so that that's still a debate, you know. And if everybody else wants to leave a voicemail on this, yeah, let us know what you think. If you're doing value pricing effectively in your firm, let us know. I, I would love to hear an example of maybe a time it worked, a time it didn't work too. Hey, you know, I'm a big fan of value pricing, but I, I do agree there are times when it fails spectacularly. Uh, <laughs> so let us know. What is that number, David? Do you have that handy? Uh, yes, the number is two zero two. 695-1040. 202-695-1040. Give us a call. It's a Google voice number. You can leave a message. It goes straight to voicemail. Uh, we get that as an MP3 file. We'll listen to it. It caps out at about three minutes. So do keep it. What is the word? Pithy? Pithy is a good word. Try to keep it short and uh, love to hear from you. And if you want to connect with us online, we're happy to do that as well. I'm on Twitter. I am at Blake T. Oliver. How about you, David? And I'm at David Leary. And I do want to end, though, on this one feel-good story. Let's hear it. Because it, it, it's arguably the best story I read this week. Um, it, it does. It's so it's so great. It, so this was on Going Concern. So let me ask you a question, Blake. Have you ever gotten anything from Kickstarter before? Or have you ever put money into a Kickstarter? It's always like crazy things. Like it's a wallet that folds six ways and it's also a butter knife connected. So, it's always like crazy you don't need, right? Yeah. So I've wanted to. I've been tempted to. I don't think I've ever actually done a Kickstarter because I've heard of so many never delivering that I just, so I, I'm afraid of it. I think I found one for all of us to get behind. So there's an article in uh, Going Concern, and arguably this is one of the better Going Concern articles I've seen in a long time. Okay. So they discovered this Kickstarter project and they give kind of background story on it. So, and, and there's so many little things I love about this story. So uh, Dave Lemke, L-E-M-K-E, so he, they describe him as a public accounting grunt. Mm -hmm. So when he started a few years ago at his big four job, they gave him a laptop. Well, what do laptops are they missing? Or what are, 10 key. Oh yeah, 10 keys, yes. A lot you of them. You don't have a 10 yeah. key. Nobody has a 10 key on their, basically on their laptop, right? And you know, you either take out an old keyboard, plug it into your computer, you can buy a, an external 10 key pad. Mm -hmm. So he just was upset with it. And he realized like, I'm in Excel all day. And so he designed on a piece of paper, a 10 key for everything he needs to do on his for his job. And just by dumb luck, his brother was good with the 3D printer and they built a keyboard and they actually named it Lem Key, L-E-M-K-E-Y. Remember his last name was L-E-M-K-E, like that he just happened to have a name, key in his thing. So what he basically did is he, you can do everything from this. You can have your dollar signs, your equal signs. So that way you can start your if statements right from your 10 key. Mm -hmm. um, F2 and escape. So you can get it out of cells. Um, he has an alt key on it. So you can... Uh, um, quickly access other tools and switch tabs and change. Uh, you never have to use your left hand. So this or, is you know, like, use your 10 key. it's, it's an improvement on the 10 key that would by default come with my keyboard because it's designed for accountants. That's correct. Ah, cool. And you, and so you can just, uh, and even has, um, the section symbol on windows. So you can cite tax codes. Like it's, it's everything you need to do as an account or bookkeeper in a 10 key. Well, David, I think that we should help support this Kickstarter as the podcast because it's got like, 
$6,500 pledged of a $10,000 goal. 92 backers, well, 29 days, 27 days to go. Well, well, here's the best part. Like you can get it branded. So you can put your own logo so we can have Cloud oh, Accounting Podcast awesome. 10 keys. So uh, I think I'm going to order one um, because I've been kicking around the idea of having a 10 key anyways. And this this actually makes so much sense to be able to have this. That's awesome. Um, it's almost in a way like because you can get those separate gaming 10 keys now for gamers mm-hmm. and they're ergonomic. We're, we're in an environment with building something like this and getting out to market. It's not hard. So it's just nobody's ever considered the needs of accountants or bookkeepers on a 10 key. We were probably the number one consumer of the 10 key functionality. So if you want to support this Kickstarter, you can find it on Kickstarter. It's the Lem key 10 key L E M K E Y. And the link will be in the show notes. I'm going to, as soon as we get done recording here, I'm going to go on and uh, put my credit card and buy one. Sounds great. David, so good to talk to you as usual. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you here next week. Bye. Time for the classifieds. Still sending spreadsheets of unclassified expenses to clients? With Client Hub, automate this process and get client answers instantly. Client Hub is a client communication platform that helps you consolidate client communication, securely share files, and instantly get answers and much, much more. Get started today with a free trial at clienthub.app and enter promo code CAP25 for 25% off your first three months. Client Hub, frictionless client communication.